Good evening, everyone. I am Angela Corey, the special prosecutor for the Trayvon Martin case. Just moments ago, we spoke by phone with Sabrina Fulton and Tracy Martin. It was less than three weeks ago that we told those sweet parents that we would get answers to all of their questions, no matter where our quest for the truth led us. And it is the search for justice for Trayvon that has brought us to this moment. The team here with me has worked tirelessly looking for answers in Trayvon Martin's death. I want to introduce to you Bernie Delarianda, one of my top homicide prosecutors, and John Guy, my other top homicide prosecutor, who will lead this investigation. With us also is Jim Madden from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, Dominic Pate, also one of our special agents in charge, our sheriff, John Rutherford, and our undersheriff, Dwayne Centerfit. We appreciate so much all of their cooperation in this. And I especially want to thank my two state attorney investigators, T.C. Osteen and Dale Gilbrook, who have spent countless hours doing what they do best, investing, investigating homicides. Oh, excuse me. Allow me to take a moment to acknowledge our governor, Rick Scott, and his office, Attorney General Pam Bondi and her office, along with our U.S. attorney, Bobby O'Neill, for their continuing support of our appointment to this case and their support of this investigation. We spoke with all of them briefly and informed them of the results of our investigation and our plan as we continue. I can tell you we did not come to this decision lightly. This case is like a lot of the difficult cases we have handled for years here in our circuit, and we've made this decision in the same manner. Let me emphasize that we do not prosecute by public pressure or by petition. We prosecute based on the facts of any given case, as well as the laws of the state of Florida. When they appointed us to this case less than three weeks ago, I want you to know that these two fine prosecutors, despite all that is on their plate already, handling all of the homicides in the Fourth Judicial Circuit, supervising the other young lawyers who also handle homicides, they willingly took this case on and said, we will lead this effort to seek justice for Trayvon. We launched an intensive investigation building on all of the work that Sanford Police Department and the State Attorney's Office in Seminole County had already done. Unless you've ever been a law enforcement officer or a prosecutor handling a difficult homicide case, you cannot know what it's like to launch this type of investigation and come to the right conclusion. The Supreme Court has defined our role on numerous occasions as prosecutors that we are not only ministers of justice, we are seekers of the truth. And we stay true to that mission. Again, we prosecute on facts and the laws of the great and sovereign state of Florida, and that's the way it will be in this case. When we took our oath of office in 2009, we pledged not only to look out for our precious victims of all of our cases, but also to adhere to the rules of the criminal justice system and the rules of our constitution and statutes that protect a defendant's rights as well. When we charge a person with a crime, we are equally committed to justice on their behalf as we are on our victim's behalf. So we are here to do that on behalf of our victim, Trayvon Martin, and on behalf of the person responsible for his death, George Zimmerman. We will continue to seek the truth throughout this case. Every single day, our prosecutors across this great country handle difficult cases, and they adhere to that same standard, a never-ending search for the truth and a quest to always do the right thing for the right reason. There is a reason cases are tried in a court of law, not in the court of the public and not by the media, because details have to come out in excruciating and minute fashion. Detail by detail, bit of evidence by bit of evidence. And it's only then when the trier of fact, whether it's a judge or a jury, gets all of those details that then the law is applied to that and a decision can be rendered. We will scrupulously adhere to our ethical obligations and to the rules of evidence in presenting this case that way. Today we filed an information charging George Zimmerman with murder in the second degree. A capius has been issued for his arrest.
With the filing of that information and the issuance of a capius, he will have a right to appear in front of a magistrate in Seminole County within 24 hours of his arrest, and thus formal prosecution will begin. We thank all of those people across this country who have sent positive energy and prayers our way. We ask you to continue to pray for Trayvon's family as well as for our prosecution team. I want to especially thank Mr. Crump and Mr. Parks who have stayed in touch daily with us on behalf of our victim's family. Remember, it is Trayvon's family that are our constitutional victims and who have the right to know the critical stages of these proceedings. I will entertain some questions, but remember, we have very strict rules of ethics, very strict rules of criminal procedure, and we will be adhering to those rules. I will confirm that Mr. Zimmerman is indeed in custody. I will not tell you where. That's for his safety as well as everyone else's safety. I'm sorry. We don't discuss the evidence in a case. It would be improper to do so. It was a full investigation, full facts and circumstances that lead us to any decision in any case. I'm sorry. Mr. Zimmerman turned himself in and was subs and, and by turning himself in was arrested on the capias that had already been issued. Why did it take why did it take so long to come to this decision? Well, it didn't take long. We have many complicated homicides that are thoroughly investigated. Remember, the prosecutor's burden under our Constitution is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. But it's been 45 days since Trayvon Martin was killed. Can you talk about the process leading up to this? And did somebody well, drop the ball in the investigation? I can tell you that this investigation was underway by both the Sanford Police Department and Norm Wolfinger's office. The investigation was in full mode. And the governor appointed us less than three weeks ago, and we took what the work that they had done, which was significant. We carried on with that work, and we arrived at our decision approximately last week. And then, of course, following proper Florida law and procedure, we had to make sure we had everything in place to issue this capius and make this arrest. How confident yes, are you in your evidence? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Can you tell us what it was about what you uncovered that leads you to that's what will be in court, detail by detail, piece of evidence by piece of evidence, factual evidence, physical evidence, testimonial evidence. That's why we try cases in a courtroom. Can you tell us whether Mr. Zimmerman is in the state of Florida? Is there already a bonding process underway? Uh, I can tell you that in Seminole County, and I want to thank their chief judge. He was very kind in helping us start setting these procedures up last week. He informed us that they have a bond schedule there. And when a capius is issued, there is originally no bond, but that Mr. Zimmerman's lawyers will be entitled to request a bond, at which point a bond hearing will be held. Bond hearings are a common occurrence. Our lawyers handle them every day. And that's where that will be determined as to whether or not no bond, which is the bond set currently on the capius, will be changed by the court. Yes, ma'am. Have you determined whose voice is crying for help on 911? Uh, that would be commenting on the facts of the case, and we're not going to do that at this time. Mr. Yes, Mr. Catherine. Talk about why your, your investigation led you to a secondary murder charge where the Sanford Police investigation didn't even arrest Well, um, I don't believe that question is accurate in the sense that when you have a homicide, Florida's jury instructions even say that before you can reach a degree of homicide, you have to determine whether a person has committed an excusable homicide or a justifiable homicide. All murders are homicides, but not all homicides are murders. And Florida's law clearly says that if there is the affirmative defense of, for example, excusable homicide or justifiable homicide, that should be determined before you go to the degree of the crime. That's the process this case took. The only slight delay was the fact that the governor stepped in and appointed us to take this case over and handle it, and we did. Would this court be conducted full and complete? I mean, if they had conducted a full investigation, do you believe Sanford Police would have arrived at the same point as you? We work together with our law enforcement officers here. As you see, I have my sheriff and our undersheriff here. We work with all of our law enforcement agencies where we try to work these cases together. Remember, prosecutors are law enforcement as well. 
and we work these cases with our investigating agencies, and we try to come to as many mutual decisions as we can. This case was in that process when the governor stepped in and appointed us to take it over. We have continued to work with the Sanford Police Department. We got full cooperation and all of those significant documents and records from Mr. Wolfinger's office, and then Bernie and John and their team took this over and did a lot more work, and, and we came to our conclusion based on the facts and Florida's law. And yes, sir. Yes, uh, yes ma'am. Obviously, the maximum sentence for second-degree murder would be life in prison. Is it your desire, as the prosecutor of this case, to see him go to jail for life, Mr. Zimmerman? We don't make that determination at this time. What we are committed to do is get this case through the court system, and then, and if it goes to a, the trier of fact as the judge or the trier of fact of the jury, once there is a decision, then we would concern ourselves with the sentence. Mr. Zimmerman, I'm sorry. Have you been contacted by new counsel? I have not personally been contacted. I do understand that he may have retained new counsel in the past couple of hours. Ms. Corey, when he turned himself in, did he have anything to say? What was his demeanor? If he did, I wouldn't be able to comment on it. I want you to know up front that one of the specific things we're not allowed to discuss are the statements of a defendant charged with a crime. And again, it's a constitutional protection that you all should be happy law enforcement affords every person charged with a crime. Corey, yes, sir. I'm sorry? Is he in, is Mr. Zimmerman in I will not comment on where Mr. Zimmerman is. I can tell you he is within the custody of law enforcement officers in the state of Florida, and um, he will be taken when it's appropriate for the appropriate appearance in front of a judge. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Would Norman have arrived at the same conclusion? Is that what you're saying? I speak for Angela Corey and my prosecution team. This is the conclusion that we came to based on um, our review of the facts and evidence. I, I'm not sure they were through with the entire investigation at the point Mr. Wolfinger um, recused himself from this case. Ms. Corey, did you? We have to have a reasonable certainty of conviction before we file charges. Anytime there's an affirmative defense, and there are numerous affirmative defenses that can be asserted before the arrest, immediately after the arrest, during the trial, we've had them come up in the middle of trial, haven't we? My fellow prosecutors that sit here, we've all faced this before. For example, alibi is an affirmative defense. Sometimes that gets put on us in the middle of the trial. So an affirmative defense always makes the criminal prosecution more difficult. We do everything within our power to take the facts we have at hand and prove the case beyond a reasonable Ms. Corey, I'm curious, as to, yes, sir. I'm curious as to get your opinion on what this has done for the debate about race and justice and the role that race might have in the pursuit of justice here. This has sparked a I'm huge debate. I'm going to be quite honest with you, and I have some people who have lived through our justice system here, and they are among the finest people in Jacksonville, Florida. They represent but a small sample of the people who know that those of us in law enforcement are committed to justice for every race, every gender, every person of any persuasion whatsoever. They are our victims. We only know one category as prosecutors, and that's a V. It's not a B, it's not a W, it's not an H, it's V for victim. That's who we work tirelessly for. And that's all we know is justice for our victims. And we still have to maintain the constitutional rights. Remember our role, ministers of justice. Anytime we take over a case, even from each other, we sometimes re-interview, we thoroughly go through the reports, we try to gather more evidence. Um, a lot of the witnesses had already made statements uh, in public even before we took over this case. So a thorough review of all of the statements that were made was done. And I can tell you I've got the finest prosecution team ever. I know every boss feels that way, but these people have the best experience you can ask for. I'm sorry, and I'll, I'll get to you in just one second. I'm sorry, yes, ma'am? Were there new witnesses who you encountered during that process? Um, Florida is a full discovery state, and when and if the defense requests participation in the discovery process, the witness list will be released at that time. Well, Hold on one second. Yes, sir? Under Florida law,
I'm sorry. I thought I articulated very clearly that we don't discuss the facts of the case, and that's for a reason. We're law enforcement. This is the criminal justice system. People's rights have to be protected. And it's designed a certain way, not only under the Constitution of the United States and the state of Florida, we have rules of criminal procedure, Florida statutes and rules of ethics. So much information got released on this case that never should have been released. We have to protect this investigation and this prosecution for Trayvon, for his family, and for George Zimmerman, and that's what we will continue to do. Angela, did you talk to George personally at all? I did not, Catherine. We don't talk to any defendant who's represented by counsel unless he waives his right to counsel. We never even had to address that situation. Yesterday, the attorneys who were representing Mr. Zimmerman, or at least speaking for him, said they had recused themselves because, themselves because they hadn't been in contact with him. Can you shed any light at all on how Mr. Zimmerman came to turn himself in? I Was cannot. It's a coordinated process at all? Can it's a coordinated anybody? process, and law enforcement has had this under control since we've gotten this case. And I know there was a lot of speculation about, oh, my goodness, does law enforcement know where he is? Do we have this under control? This is what we do every single day on behalf of our community. It's what FDLE does every single day on behalf of the citizens of this great state. The governor and Pam Bondi put as much or as many resources as they could on this case. And I don't think that there was ever a concern that if the decision was made to charge Mr. Zimmerman, that it would be made in a timely fashion and that law enforcement would have it under control to take him into custody. At this early stage, do you expect the trial to be in Seminole County? We don't know that yet. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. Okay. His former attorney said yesterday that he actually contacted you. Can you talk about what happened when you all received that phone call? What happens with every phone call? A message was taken, and I turned it over to Bernie, and Bernie handled it from there. But uh, we called his lawyers because, again, we don't talk to someone represented by counsel pursuant to our rules of ethics. So no contact was made specifically between Mr. Delarionda. Mr. Guy is, was, and is still prosecuting a first-degree murder case where our victim is a former Marine who was brutally shot for a few dollars at a gas station here. We have unfortunately, brutal homicides that we fight hard for all the time. We will fight just as hard in this case. So yes, sir. Does your findings affect the Department of Justice? The Department of Justice, thank you for asking that question. They, they conduct their own investigation. I've been in contact with Bobby O'Neill, our U.S. Attorney, Tom Battle, one of the Department of Justice uh, people who's helped us with a lot of the uh, civil rights contacts and issues. Um, He's helping us. A whole slew of DOJ lawyers are helping us, but they're not working on our part of the investigation, and we don't work on their part of the investigation. We always share information with our federal counterparts on numerous cases when and if it's needed. You, you said you don't want to discuss the facts of the case, but, but by what the actions that you are taking, you are basically making a statement that you do not believe standing your ground is a plausible defense. Could you at least address the fact that you, by taking this action and by arresting Mr. Zimmerman, you are, in fact, saying stand your ground in your mind does not come to play in this case. This case is just like many of the shooting deaths we've had in our circuit. If stand your ground becomes an issue, we fight it if we believe it's the right thing to do. So if it becomes an issue in this case, we will fight that affirmative defense. How would you say stand your ground has affected your job? My prosecutors... And a lot of them are here, and I'm so proud of them. They have worked tirelessly running this office while we've been working on this case. They fight these stand-your-ground motions. Mr. Moody just finished a four-day full stand-your-ground motion on another case. We fight hard. Some of them we've won, and we've had to appeal them, or the defense has appealed, and we've won it on appeal. Some we fought hard, and the judge ruled against us. That's happening to prosecutors all over the state. It is the law of the state of Florida, and it will be applied. Justifiable use of deadly force, as we all knew it uh, before Stand Your Ground was issued, was still a tough affirmative defense to overcome, but we still fight these cases hard. I'm not going to comment on this specific law at this time. 
We're law enforcement. We enforce the laws of the state of Florida. And if that law becomes an affirmative defense, just like alibi, insanity, entrapment, or any of the other many affirmative defenses, we'll handle it accordingly. Ms. Corey, was there... Are you sure about Seminole County being the venue currently? No, Seminole County is absolutely the venue. When we're appointed as prosecutors, we step in to the prosecution role down in Seminole County. So right now, it is the court of jurisdiction. It is the venue. The question was, did we think we'd be able to try the case there? Or I thought, was that your question, Bob? Okay. Did did we think we'd be able to try it there? That's a determination that will be made closer to if and when we pick a jury. Which brings me to my question about publicity, perhaps based in part on publicity and pretrial publicity. Tell us your concerns about what you've heard, what you've seen out there in publicity if you have and what effect did it have on a jury in Seminole County or elsewhere? You asked about my concerns, I will tell you. There's been an overwhelming amount of publicity in this case that we hope does not keep us from being able to pick a fair and impartial jury. Both the state and the defense are entitled to a fair and impartial jury. Um, we think a lot of facts got put out. And see, that's the problem. When I told you it comes out in front of a jury, they're not allowed to render a decision until everything is in front of them. In fact, they're specifically instructed by the judge that they can't form a decision until they've heard everything. And so it is regrettable that so many facts and details got released and misconstrued, but we hope that um, a lot of it, and the the media has helped toning it down a lot and making sure that people understand Florida law and the process. And we hope that people will continue to do that. Ms. Corey, was it before that you looked closely at how the police conduct their investigation? Looking back at the Sanford Police Department, would you say, was their investigation... Well, I'm not going to comment on that other than that they were a tremendous help to us and had already done a lot of witness interviews. They did what the police do. Anytime you have a shooting scene and there's there's, um, a person whose death is caused, the police launch a thorough and intensive investigation. That was done here, but before the investigation could be finished, there was a lot of outcry about this case, and then it changed course, and we got appointed to take over the investigation. But based on the details you know of the case and what happened that evening, do you think it's reasonable to expect that there should have been an arrest that evening? We have numerous homicides where immediate arrests are not made. And so to us, it did not seem unusual. I think judgment has to be made when the final decision is reached. And that's what we would have hoped the public would have waited for. But some people did not wait. And so an arrest can only be based upon probable cause. And so we believe that that's what the Sanford Police Department was trying to do. And if there is any sort of determination as to what they did or didn't do, that will be handled by someone other than our prosecution team. Ms. Corey, yes, did you ask both the name of Trayvon Martin's parents at the very beginning of this new I did. Can you shed any more light on the length and breadth of that conversation with them? And did they express confidence that your process now will be able to bring them to justice? They feel like the, they need and have been denied. I think that after meeting with Trayvon's parents <clears throat> that first Monday night after we got appointed in this case, Bernie was there. John was there, our prosecution team was there. The first thing we did was pray with them. We opened our meeting in prayer. Mr. Crump and Mr. Parks were there. We did not promise them anything. In fact, we specifically talked about if criminal charges do not come out of this, what can we help you do to make sure your son's death is not in vain? And they were very kind and very receptive to that. And as I stated, Mr. Delariana has been in touch with Mr. Crump and with Ms. Fulton and Mr. Martin since we took over this case, and we intend to stay in touch with them. But basically, we only had a few minutes to talk with them. I believe they are going to want to talk later, um, and they, they now know that uh, charges have been filed, and they are now hearing, as we speak, that George Zimmerman is in custody of law enforcement in our state. We're very proud of the job law enforcement has done, and we're very proud to stand here and tell you that we represent the people of the state of Florida. Thank you so much.